You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means we are back for the Thursday edition of of the old OB, a.k.a. the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-scintillating network upon which so many of you are binging these days. Remember, if you're on demand, as I know a lot of you are, and you like what you hear, this show, anything we do on the network, leave a review. It does help the new folks discover. You can leave it on this show if you just subscribe to the Option Block. You can leave it to the full network if you're subscribed to all of that. Hopefully, you're subscribed to the latter. If not, you're missing out on a whole freaking heck of a lot of content listening. So make sure you're A, listening to the whole network, and B, if you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. You can argue more important than ever in these troubled times that people have a lighthouse, a beacon to pull them toward the quality content and away from the the scammers and the opportunists lurking out there in all the different podcast stores. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, join us throughout the week, unfettered access to all of our shows live, asking questions for not just this show, but everything we do throughout the week here on the network, as well as a couple of exclusive shows just for you, then you know where to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. That gets you access to all this goodness and a whole bunch more, the giveaways, the live shows, the, the exclusive programming, all kinds of fun stuff there, theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. And of course, however you listen, if you're on the live front, if you're after the fact, however that is, if you have questions, Keep hitting us up. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on Ye old Program. Once again, let's go out now to the dark, the stormy shores of Maine, where he's just left to brood with the crickets surrounding him all the time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listeners, go back to some episodes. You, you'll hear what I'm talking about. He is the rockingest of lobsters. Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the program. How goes the brooding? On the dark and stormy shores of Maine, sir. Actually, there was there was my first hint of spring today, Mister Mister oh. Longo. Did your ice rink melt? <laughs> it was snowing this morning, but the chipmunks and the birds were hitting the bird feeder. Oh, so it's the birds first, are uh, It was my first sighting of twenty twenty two. You you would think somebody so dark and stormy would not have a bird feeder yet. I do I do mingle with the critters in the woods. Indeed. Interesting. So you do feed the local wildlife. So then, of course, you could trap them and kill them and do whatever else you do to them in, in the dark and stormy Jovenazzi right. compound. Make pelts. Make yes, pelts. pelts. <laughs> <laughs> Going back. I hear that beaver trade making, pelts. A, making a comeback. A chipmunk, yes. beaver skins. That's the hot item these days. Forget Maine lobsters. Chipmunk pelts from, st- from the shores of Maine. <laughs> At least I crack myself up. Listen, let's keep on rolling out to the shores of the Fox River to a quiet land known as St. Charles, 
where we are joined once again by the uncleist of Mike's, Mr. Uncle Mike Tusa from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. How are things on the never dark and stormy shores of the Fox River? You know, they're good. It's it's interesting that Andrew's bringing up his critters. I actually, a friend took me out coyote hunting last weekend. I had never done it before. Uh, we didn't get anything, but uh, I, I thought he was doing it all wrong. He had a, a rabbit decoy. I, I think he was doing it all wrong. He should have had uh, anvils and uh, catapults with giant rocks and uh, portable X's. Yeah, he needed he needed the Acme bundle. He didn't have that with him. No, he didn't. I think that's why we didn't shoot anything. Oh, yeah. I think you messed up there. <laughs> what is what is the caliber of choice for coyote hunting? What do you hunt them with? I, I brought my twelve gauge out. It was a new experience for me. I'd never done it. I had a ton of fun, but we didn't get any. We didn't even see any. But uh, I was just I had a lot of fun with it, though. It might not be my last coyote hunting experience. Coyote hunting just come downtown. There's been multiple incidents of coyotes just roaming the loop. <laughs> Other things going into freezers and in stores and restaurants. So yes, we we do have some wildlife. Not the kind you think maybe in Chicago, but we do have some wildlife down here in the heart of Chicago. Instead of coyote hunting, those let's, let's go hunt some volatility. It is time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading out there. And, you know, for hunting some volatility, I guess you got to be kind of quick on the uptake today if you want to capture all that volatility because there's a little bit less on the screen now than there was. It's kind of one of those weird days, listeners, and the market really can't seem to decide what it wants to be today. It's up, it's down, it's mixed. We're kind of in the mixed category right now. Dow up slightly, about 0.15%. S&P effectively unched slightly in the red, but nothing really going on there. And then the NASDAQ off about three quarters of a point. So once again, NASDAQ has a firm direction. The rest of the market kind of can't figure out what the heck it wants to do. So vol commensurately has been up, has been down, has been all over the place today as well. Now it's Swinging back to the dark side as we kicked off the show. VIX had come in about another point or so down to a little bit north of 30, about 30 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. That's actually down a point from this time on Monday's show. A VIX of the Vol of Vol was looking north of 125 earlier this morning. Coming in to start the show about 122 and a half. That puts it up slightly, about half a point, which if you know anything about VIX, you know it's pretty much a rounding error at that point. A VXX at about 24 and three quarters when we kicked off the show. That puts it up about three quarters of a point. So still up, but given some of that back. UBXY was at about 1835 when we kicked off the show. That's still up. Not quite a full point, about 0.85 from where it was on Monday. My UBXY fly. I was joking about it earlier this week on the uh, on the pro Q&A, but actually not looking too bad out there right now. Long, again, you got to do the fly. You got to sell something against it. Hard to just buy UVXY in any direction these days and make money. But if you got other legs against it, you can do all right. And that fly looking pretty good. It was on the 18 strike. So that makes it kind of interesting. And VolQ at about 30 and a half when we kicked off the show. That's actually exactly unched from where it was on Monday show, which kind of shows you what kind of day we're having. We're whipping all over and the vol indices are moving all over. But right as we kicked off the show, VolQ settling in exactly where it was on monday's show so a lot to unpack in this kind of weird market obviously a lot of a lot of domestic and international waves are buffeting the markets these days of course had powell maybe talking things back a little bit earlier this week and then we had putin kind of ratcheting things up overseas so kind of a bit of a one-two punch going on out there let's go around the horn let's go back because things are kind of let's say uncertain right now let's go to the to the unclest of mics he's always good for a little bit of reliable optimism a ray of sunshine in these dark times. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is lighting up your tape out there on a kind of shrug your shoulders day, at least right now? Yeah, I would say so for now uh, with the S&P. I think we, we're up less than a point right now. So the S&P is flat on the day. Uh, I think everyone just watching um, Fed Chairman Powell testify before Congress these last couple of days. And so from what I'm getting from that, it, the, the main thing that it seems uh, he, he it looks like at his fe at the Fed meeting in a couple of weeks they're talking about raising point raising rates by only a quarter of a point not a half a point that may or may not be a good idea for the long run uh, we'll see in the long run uh, but that seems to be the main thing that's uh, stabilizing this market somewhat in that we're going the quarter point route instead of the half point route maybe 
Now, he did say that he wanted to remain fluid and that things, a lot of things can change in a, in a couple of weeks because of what's happening with the Russia-Ukraine situation. So I think that right now, uh, the market seems to be somewhat uncertain with that uh, because of the uncertainty, of course. And the other thing is that we're awaiting non-farm coming out tomorrow. So I think the market's just kind of in wait and see mode and we might get a break on something based on non-farm. Now, the other thing to consider is that uh, it looks like there might be some more talks between Russia and the Ukraine about some possible uh, more negotiations coming to fruition. Uh, we'll see what that happens. And so it seems that right now, the market's just kind of, like you said, shrugging up its shoulders. Now, the one thing that I am noticing that has not been shrugging its shoulders, that has been uh, getting some pretty decent movement over the course of the last couple of days, is the exciting thing of the 10-year note. <laughs> the 10-year note has kind of moved a little bit, uh, how can we put it, uh, all over the place for the last couple of days, in that uh, we have it we had a lot of buyers coming in on, uh, excuse me, on Tuesday, and then it sold off again yesterday. And then today there's a little bit of buying going on, but not a lot. So it seems to me that perhaps there was a lot of people buying uh, before the Fed spoke. And then once uh, Powell spoke, uh, there's uh, some selling going on. So for the time being, it looks like we're going to be a little bit more stable in that we're kind of right back to where we started before the Fed meeting. And I think that over the course of the next couple of weeks, it'll be interesting to see how treasuries react in this very important announcement or this very important meeting that the Fed's having on the next couple of weeks. So that's lighting up my tape. And the fact that uh, we can't quite get through that 4,400 mark, I mean, we did for a, briefly on the SPX, but we're just not, seems like that's holding up this rally a little bit, but we'll see what happens. There's uh, three more hours left, almost three more hours left in the trading day today, so we could break it, but uh, time will tell. Time will tell indeed. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, same question for you. What is time telling you about these somewhat shoulder shruggy markets today? Um, I, I think you, you said, I, you know, it's funny. I was just doing the nitro trader with Mark and he was trying to fill some spreads and, <laughs> uh, let's just say filling anything, not easy. If you try to put an option trade the last couple of days, um, there, the liquidity providers, I just, it's funny. I remember when, you know, going through wars and going into wars and like Gulf War and Afghanistan and then Iraq, like all this stuff. Um, just how like how illiquid things feel. When you're on a trading floor, you used to be able to feel these things. Um, like the you could feel the illiquidity. <laughs> you could feel, you know, the theta melting in, you know, your positions. Yeah, because nobody was um, there. It was a ghost town, right? So you could tell it it's, just, it's kind of illiquid yeah. now. Nobody's here. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why. They're all Nobody's at series. on the floor. Yes. <laughs> They're all in series having a drink, waiting to see what happens. So um, the, uh, you know, and there was opportunity, of course, you know, but you waited till the prices came to you. And I think this is a, and uh, like, I think Tucson, you know, he's like, he has his rule, like, hey, I like to see, uh, I want to see new highs before I, you know, maybe put on, you know, kind of get my longs on, you know. And, you know, it's a definitely a time for caution. Um, but I'm, I am adding to some longer term positions. Uh, just just I find it easier. There are some stocks out there where the, the vol's not terrible and the market hates them anyway. So it's not a stock that stocks I expect to do anything in the meantime anyway. Um, so but short term position trading is very, I would say, not easy um, right now. So. Uh, I mean, the VIX is definitely down. There are ceasefire talks going on and Putin doesn't want to leave. Um, and, you know, it's like it's hard to say anything political about all of this stuff. But I just think like the Russians, you know, whatever. They they, they don't want NATO in Ukraine. So whatever that means, um, they got pretty testy about it. So that's where we are right now. Um, you know, the guy's in there and he ain't going to leave. Um so, I mean, you, I'm trying to think of how many sanctions they pile on, like they're taking away the rich guy's yachts. You know, you can't play soccer anymore. You're kicked out of FIFA. Like, 
You know, once you go to soccer, that's big. I know that that's that's hitting them where it hurts when you take away the <laughs> take away the old yeah. football. Yeah, it's like you know, like you take away hockey pretty soon, and then we're going to start. You know, then the 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 average person is going to start griping here. You know, they shut down Apple. They, you can't have. You know, you can't buy your you know assembly furniture from IKEA. Like all kinds of these companies are like, eh, we just like don't want to deal. You know, and I think after the COVID crisis, like big corporations are like, we just don't want to deal. You know, sorry guys, but <laughs> the landscape is too treacherous for us. Um, you know, and then of course the Chinese might be looking at all this and like, oh, maybe we have. You know, it's not like they have a lot of dollar investments, but they do have a lot of uh, bonds because of the huge trade deficit. So, I mean, the reality is these, uh, you know, the economies are intertwined. Um, you know, even the Russians like divesting themselves. It kind of reminds me of the, you know, Prince Philip's War. I mean, I'm I'm going back to 1680, right? But before the U.S. was a country, you know, like the Indians and the settlers were pretty tightly mixed. Um, um, at that point, the settlers had been there for about 70 years or 60 years. Um, and then like, you know, the settlers started taking more Indian land and, you know, and obviously they did because the U S came here, but, you know, created this friction. Right. And then they had to like, they literally, it was like having a war with your next door neighbor and it was real destructive. Um, a pretty terrible uh, thing. I don't know how, you know, I'm kind of a history, history geek, but, um, I think that's kind of what this is feeling like, right? Just sort of destructive, um, short term, not really any winners. Um, and it actually got quite, um, quite bloody. Um, and I hope this doesn't turn out like that, but you know, when you're, when you have, uh, such things so intertwined like this, you don't know how it's going to turn out. So, you know, maybe the West settles, find some like, Sign some deal that Ukraine won't be part of NATO for 25 years or 30. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but that, that's leaving the markets, what I would say, in flux. Like volatility is very high. SPX vol is very high. But the SPX isn't moving. So that's classic vol fatigue. Um, you know, so you, you get these, I guess, waves of vol coming in and out of uh, um, the market. And it's like a jello market, right? You put your finger, you try to. You know, it's like uh, like a jello mold, a summer jello mold. You put your finger in, it just keeps going. Like so, when you're trying to buy options, but you don't pay the offer, and you know, and the and the systems are set up like the offers keep getting higher and higher. You know, you don't get filled. But you put in a spread anywhere close to the market, and you don't get filled. Maybe an apple because it's so it's so liquid. But you got you know, you have illiquidity issues, just difficult times. So you have to really want whatever you're doing at this point. So. And I don't know how long it goes on. I remember this going on for months um, in 1991, um, actually half a year, really. It was pretty long uh, while, you know, Iran was kicking, uh, you know, they kicked the, the Kuwaiti butt pretty bad at the beginning. Um, and then it, things got better and after the invasion pretty fast. Same with Af Afghanistan. Um, same with Iraq war and the Iraq war, like all this stuff. So. Um, again, these are, these are historical, you know, history, uh, tends to, I would not repeat, but they say it rhymes. Um, and that's what we're feeling. I hope this cuss works out where they kind of have a ceasefire and, you know, the Russians are just there and they're not going to give up. Um, cause I don't see them leaving and the market just, you know, just deals with what that is. Um, and the massive commodity problems that could result from this, like raw earth materials, oil, gas, they haven't, you know, when they're serious, when they shut off the natural gas and the oil into Eastern, into Europe, even in the US, the US imports oil now from the Russians. So <laughs> it's a, I'm pretty sure the last administration didn't do that. So this is definitely a bit of 180 degrees on all that stuff. So. Uh, again, it's there's a lot of confusing stuff going on, and it's not settled, um, and that just leaves volatility high and the market not doing much. And I think that's what you're stuck with. So, best to find something you really want to own at a price you want to own, and you know, and look at the long term because short term, you know, tomorrow we could be anywhere. I think VIX could be 22 or 40 tomorrow, just depending on whatever the news might come be. If it's 
you know, major news. So I'll just, again, I would say, and that's what the market is pricing, like insane moves, but they're not happening today. And I think that's kind of the state of where we are. Deep cut there, bringing up the King Phillips War, sir. You know, you're, you're becoming a diehard New Englander when you're only people who <laughs> grew up or live in New England have ever even heard of King Phillips War. Yeah, ironically, one of the bloodiest per capita wars here on U.S. soil, listeners. So a pretty nasty stuff. Everyone thinks of the French and Indian War. That was more like 1750s or so. This was actually still back in the 1600s, King. Look it up if you haven't checked it out in a little bit. So a dark period in our early history there. Yes. Leave it to the rock lobster in the dark of stormy shores of Maine <laughs> to bring up a horrific bloodletting from the yes, 1600s. If you want dark, I will give you dark. <laughs> He's not just murdering crickets. He's reading about historical murder as well, which is always... Always a good time there. That's why we call them the dark and stormy shores of Maine, listeners. <laughs> All right. Let's go on out and see if these markets are looking dark and stormy. Vix putting up a little bit more paper since we started talking here. Vix is at about exactly 300. Actually, just ticked up 301,000 contracts. That puts it up almost at exactly half of its ADV. Its ADV has come in quite a bit as well. It's down into 500 handle now, 500,000 handle now. A 599 to be precise. So one tick below 600K. So we're at pretty much exactly half a day's worth of volume out there in VIX. Of course, you know, if you've been listening to the show for a little bit, we got up to about 750 ADV wise not too long ago. Again, I said it before, it's hard for VIX to maintain that. And I don't know if we as a society want VIX to maintain an ADV north of 700,000. That means other things are afoot that maybe aren't exactly broadly beneficial uh spy coming into as of a few minutes ago actually was that closing out of four million contracts about 3.93 million contracts the adv out there about 7.3 not a huge change in the adv out there and spy land spy is always putting up numbers even on a pretty quiet day the s 667,000 contracts right now the adv 1.71 that has come in a little bit only slightly it was about 1.8 million not too long ago and uh small caps at least the iwm flavor 426,000 the ADV 860, so that has come in a bit as well from the 1 million level. If you want more about small caps, join us in a little bit for Twifo. In fact, the Rock Lobster is talking about commodities. Man, we got some got some price action in the ags <laughs> to talk about. We'll have Carly Garner joining us in a little bit later on Twifo to break it all down. Man, wheat. Our listeners are on it. You guys were mentioning, is Putin maybe looking at wheat? You guys were asking that in our pro Q&A over a month ago before all this stuff started popping off. Obviously, energy has been the primary driver everyone's been focused on, but the ags especially wheat, feeling a lot of this move up nearly 30%, I think, this week in the Chicago wheat. So crazy times afoot out there, prices we have not seen in ages, over a decade. So quite some time out there. Let's see what we're seeing from an overall single name, most active perspective. And the answer is not a heck of a lot, actually. Only cost you 186,000 contracts to break into the top 10 right now, which is Pretty much nothing, listeners. You can get that on any quiet day. You can get somewhere around a buck fifty to a buck eighty. That's not much. So that kind of shows you how quiet it is in the single names right now. Everyone's kind of waiting and seeing for that next shoe to drop. A lucid number ten right now at one hundred eighty-six thousand. Actually tied with Microsoft number nine, also one hundred eighty-six thousand. Number eight is Neo, two hundred fifteen thousand. In fact, this looks like a pretty standard top ten pretty much on any given day out here today. Number seven is Facebook there for 218,000. Let's see if the old Facebook is uh, feeling any love today. Nope, off another 1.3%. Was looking a little bit higher earlier this morning up to, it's like it got about 209 before giving it back. It's threatening the 205. Actually got down to 204 this morning at one point for bouncing off of that. So had quite the range today, hovering a little bit north of 205 right now. Good for number seven, 218,000 contracts. Number six, SoFi. SoFi has been on our, Top 10, a lot of late back on there today. 237,000 contracts. So far, selling off about half a buck there, right around the 11 handle right now. Number five is our old friend Ford. They had quite the move yesterday, and they're giving some of that back up today off about 1.6%. They popped up over a buck yesterday. So I think they got up to close to 18 and a half yesterday, somewhere along those lines. How did they get? Uh, 18 and a quarter yesterday. So quite the move there yesterday after retreating during a lot of this crisis here, retreating a little bit again today. Good for number five, 284,000 contracts. Number four is NVIDIA. Again, you can kind of just run any day and number three and number four are kind of locked at this point. It's going to be AMD or NVIDIA in some order. Today it's NVIDIA number four, 315,000 contracts. Number three, it's AMD jumping up quite a bit, 591,000. AMD can put up numbers even in the quietest of days, which is kind of interesting. It's like the new Roku. Used to be for a while there, Roku was one was always a top 10. 
name and it could do numbers regardless of what else was going on out there, which was a little mystifying to me. The volatility of set top boxes. And now that has been replaced by the volatility of all things chips over there at AMD. Number two is Tesla. 724,000. That means number one is the old a pull. 953,000. There are rumors of their their next event afoot out there. So probably giving them a little bit of action today. Up about a buck or about not even three quarters of a percent today. 167 and change is where they're trading right now. They got up to about 168 and a half this morning before giving some of that back, selling off to almost 165 and a half again. So a little bit of a range out there. It kind of reflects what's been going on out there today. We're rallying. We're selling off. We're rallying. We're selling off. Still waiting for the latest updates on the earnings move earnings move results and earnings season reports though you can check out the other ones we have for you over there the options insider.com as soon as we get the newest updates there from our friends over there at orats we shall send them out to you there listen i was looking really quickly what we do have though when it comes to numbers listeners we finally have the numbers in our hot little hands for february from our friends over there at occ we've been wondering everyone's wondering kind of you know what does the future hold from an options volume perspective? No one thought, well, maybe I shouldn't say no one. I didn't think last year was going to really be the rock'em sock'em robots year that it was from a volume perspective. Nearly 10 billion contracts, threatening 1 billion a few times for monthly volume out there. Just crazy numbers. I didn't think we could really hit that. So I've kind of had some of the cynic beaten out of me. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's the inflection point. That's the capitulation. When my cynical heart recedes a little bit, that's when the market says, okay, we can dial back the options volume. Because that's pretty much what we saw in February. February was the first time we've seen a year over year decrease in volume. I'll have to go look and check to make sure, but I do believe this is the first time we've seen a year over year decrease since the start of the pandemic. Uh, February total volume down 2.6% compared to February of last year. Now, February of last year, Obviously, a bit of an outlier that we were still in the throes of all things meme madness this time last year. Of course, this year, it's not like we had a shortage of things driving vol and action in February of this year either. So it could be off to look at the trading calendar too. Sometimes how that calendar lines up, it could affect you have one or two more days here or there trading that could also impact those overall numbers. So I mean, 2.6%, not a huge change. That could be That could be just a day or two worth of volume and you got that number differently. So Interesting stuff here. The overall February volume was 807.3 million contracts, again, down 2.6%. Also a fair distance away from that closing in on 1 billion a month level we've been talking about for a while. We've seen it hit nine over 900 million multiple times, 930, I think 940, somewhere around there is the high. So well off of that as well. Uh, the ADV through February, 43.7 million contracts. That's down almost three quarters of a percent. From this time last year. So actually, if we stay on this pace for the rest of the year, then obviously we will not eclipse last year's uh, number out there, which is interesting. And it kind of seemed like almost a fate to complete at that point that we were going to just through inertia beat those numbers from last year. But again, it's just February. It's a weird short month. <laughs> so let's not read too much into it. Uh, let's see some highlights here. There were there were some notable, notable highlights. Uh, ETF options volume that was up 43.6% year over year index options volume up 23 and a half percent from this time last year as well those are two areas that have been noticeably sluggish even as the rest of the market was booming and volume was booming the index and etf options weren't exactly lighting the tape up so kind of interesting to see them lighting it up now that the rest of the volume is not exactly blowing the doors off out there so yeah interesting stuff we have the numbers for february this kind of does raise some question marks we'll have to wait and see how march performs before we really start to get a sense for the year. How does this make you feel? Does this, uh, does this maybe perhaps make you reconsider what you were thinking? We just had the flow master on our pro Q&A not too long ago. He seemed pretty determined that we were going to be able to beat last year's numbers by a pretty handy margin. So are you still on that tip? Maybe that's a good question of the week for maybe next week out here. That's just uh, something interesting to mull over as we keep on mulling the weird paper of the day. It is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right. 
right, everybody, let us commence the weird activity palooza known as the Odd Block. It is time to unleash the Eye of Sauron, see where it fixes its fiery gaze. And today it has fixed its gaze upon a newcomer to the Odd Block. Always like a new newcomer, always like a newcomer breaking their way here onto the Odd Block, exploding onto the scene. Let's see what we've got here. We've got... Technip FMC PLC. <laughs> Say that five times fast. Ticker symbol FTI. This is a French American UK domicile global oil and gas company. Jeez, say all that five times fast. Quite the <laughs> quite the lengthy and verbose description here. But yes, trading right now, seven dollars and eighteen cents, up about nine cents on the day. Anything that has to do with natural gas these days and oil, probably seeing a bit of a lift. Let's go out and see what the the tail of the tape tells us for this name here. And actually, maybe not as much as you might think. A year ago, it was actually trading higher. It was trading 868. Uh, it's given up a buck and a half since then, which is interesting. It sold off there by, let's see, April, it got down to a six handle, got down to 695 before rebounding there all the way up to their high for the year. Guess what day, listeners? Guess what day it hit its high for the year? Oh, yes. If you said June 8th, congratulations. You've been listening to the show for once again, that date has some strange magnetism to it that I, I have yet to unravel, but definitely the, it is not statistically insignificant that it keeps coming up all the time on this segment. It is very strange. June 8th hit its high for the year of $10.70 before selling off hard again by August 19th. It got down to 610, tried to rally a bit, got over the seven handle. It actually got up to an eight handle briefly in October before giving up the ghost, got down to its low for the year in December, December 1st, Get down to 555. Ever since then, it's kind of been in rally mode. It got up to pretty much where it is right now, 718. That's kind of the the high ever since that December 1st low, up a couple of almost a couple of bucks from there. So a little bit of uh, upswing of late, as you might expect, given natural gas, but also maybe not as much as you might think. I mean, we were already this was already trading seven bucks back in January, and it kind of gave a lot of that back before getting back to where it is right now, over seven bucks. So. Yeah, these nat gas plays, they're not quite as clear cut as you might think, listeners, in terms of like, look at Tellurian and all the issues you talk about that one having. It's not just as simple as you buy a name that's, that's heavily exposed to nat gas and it rallies instantly. Uh, let's go out and see what our, our friend found out here. Looks like it may not be what you think. You might think, okay, nat gas energy, you might think some call love. No, it's the opposite. You got someone coming in today, listeners, and scooping up. 4,653 of the April 7 puts, which is effectively the add the money put right now. We're a little bit shy of 720. They paid 55 cents for these. They lifted the offer. That's uh, 65 vol. That's nothing to sneeze at out there, listeners. The stock was pretty much exactly here when they did it, 717. Let's see. There are earnings, but I do believe expiration is before. Yeah, expiration is on the 15th in April, and the earnings are on the 26th. So, not going to get any earnings protection through these. Mr. Rock Lobster, it seems like someone may be fading a little bit of the recent rally in everyone's favorite technic, tech nip, easy for me to say, FMC, PLC, or maybe fading some of the impact of this recent Ukrainian crisis or all of the above because they're scooping up some at the money puts in April, sir. What say you? An interesting one. Uh, uh, oh, my gosh. The oddest name for a company ever. Who comes up with this name? <laughs> At least you don't get paid to say it all. I have to say it multiple times. I, I know. Well, you know, you do like dipping into the minutia of the funky names, you know, I have to say. This you, one's kind of hard you, to ignore. You, you, you do it. You do enjoy your oddball name in the odd block. <laughs> Once it's, or part, it's kind of part, half the fun for you. Does the, does the name, is it the same as the symbol? Do they mess it up? Do they screw with me? Do they mess with my head? You have all these these issues coming into the op block with these names. Um, this is a one where, okay, you're buying the puts because you think um, you're protecting a gain. Um, you know, the vol's pretty, I, I would say vol's, it's in the middle. I, it's not super high. Um, you know, I think they're, I don't even think they, I don't think they're covering the earnings even. So, Again, I think maybe somebody's like, okay, well, there's going to be a quick pullback. And uh, uh, let's see here. Global Energy. Oh, Energy Services. Okay, pipe and infrastructure. Interesting. Uh, okay, so I would say this is interesting. 
Um, what's really interesting is why they would buy puts in this stock. Like, That's what makes it the odd block, sir. Yeah, it just doesn't hit me as one where, you know, yeah, oil fields, under oil sea services, stuff like that. Like, I, I could see like a puts in stock trade maybe, but like buying the puts here, I mean, this is kind of a, you know, it's an $8 billion revenue company with the market caps only $3 billion. I, you know, it's just the problem is it's in the wrong place. It does subsea and surface. You know, it does all that undersea oil exploration services. So, I mean, you got to be realistic. A company like, <laughs> like, is there a, it, you know, that's not a feel like, oh, I want to get into the, you know, um, I want to, you know, I want to get into uh, <laughs> under undersea oil development because I'm sure every Western country in the world is pretty much, you know, saying, oh, no way to that. So. Um, anyway, maybe they're just they're trying to lock in some gains, something like that. Um, that's possible. Um, that's possible. But um, it's it's just a per purchase that I don't know, it seems it doesn't seem like a useful put to purchase. That's all. Just it is a weird sense. one. I mean, everyone else and their mother is scrambling to get long energy and that gas. And this guy is scrambling to buy some puts does kind of strike <laughs> you as odd. So uh, definitely merits watching. Uh, keep an eye on this one. Just if for no other reason, listeners, than the name. It's just fun to say. What was it? Technic. <laughs> I've already taken it off my screen here. Where was it? Here we go. No, there it is. Technip FMC PLC. <laughs> yes. All the, all the consonants. All the consonants. <laughs> That'd be a heck of a Scrabble word if they allowed uh, proper nouns. That would get you everything. You get all of it there. Uh, Technic FLC. F I can't even say it anymore. <laughs> let's keep, let's move on. So I don't have to say this, this ridiculous name. We will keep an eye on it though, listeners, because they, that is a little bit aberrant. People scrambling to suddenly buy puts when everyone else seems like they're inclined to the upside or at the very least, maybe taking off some of that upside now. Interesting stuff here in the world of FTI. Let's move on out to some names we've profiled recently because there isn't actually a heck of a lot lighting up the single names today. Interesting enough, listeners. Let's go out to a trade from the heady days of January 27th. Oh, we were all right before the Ukraine invasion. Everything was fresh and right with the world. Spring was coming upon us. We were waiting to see if the groundhog would see his shadow. Good times on January 27th. And at the time of the show, listeners, we profiled what looked like some, again, some put love. So people buy inputs. That's also a bit of a change of pace from what we've profiled pretty much nonstop for the last couple of years, which is people buying calls and selling puts. Now we're starting to see people actually buying puts, which is perhaps a sign of where we are in the markets right now. This was in Sirius XM listeners, tickle, ticker symbol Siri, S-I-R-I. This is the name that was, I won't tell you where it's trading yet, bit of a spoiler, but a year ago it was trading 589, had a few nice pops, got up to 709, actually 729. Again, what day listeners? June 8th. I do need to commission a study on that because it is starting to get more than a little coincidental that the apex for the year and all these names year after year, this is multiple years now, has been June 8th. That is strange. And then it sold off again and then uh, got down to 598 on January 26th before popping hard all the way up to 686 on February 9th. And that latter portion is significant for this trade because what we profiled back on January 27th, listeners, was someone coming in and scooping up 21,096. They were not playing around of the February 6 puts for 20 cents, but these were expiring on the 4th. So these are not even through traditional February expiration, which is probably a move this person came to regret. Because as I mentioned, there was a pop there in Siri from a little bit shy of the six handle, 598. On January 26th, by February 4th, the stock had closed at $6.78. So it rallied all the way through that strike and then some listeners. And so when you put the puts on, the stock was 618. It rallied 60 cents on that level over the lifespan of these options. Unfortunately, these puts were still open. Maybe fortunately, because the person owned stock, you'd have to assume. So maybe they were happy about that. But of course, it was kind of a worst case scenario, listeners, because the stock rallied pretty much. Only through the duration of his options, like right after his options expired, the stock sold off again and by uh, broke the six handle again on February 23rd. So if he had a, had a little bit more time, perhaps things could have worked out. It's hovering at 618 again right now. So still north of the six handle. 
But Mr. Rock Lobster, it seems like this person, they panicked. They scooped up some not even monthly, weekly puts here in Siri. They paid a whopping 420 grand for these things, and they let it all go the way of the dodo, sir. Um, is Siri a stock that's like been at a single digit for 100 million it years? It certainly seems like it, yes. I, it's, it's one of these ones where... And then I re- didn't they merge with XM satellite? Yeah, Sirius XM. That's like, M now. Yes. Like I remember that from ages ago. And they're like, okay, so one dumb or one like low margin business. <laughs> Let's put them together. The other dumb low. Let's put them together. Business. By the way, they hit a high of sixty three twenty five. Guess when that was, Mister Rock Lobster? <laughs> Ten years ago. A more March third of two thousand. <laughs> yeah. Because- I remember doing yes, that. Yes, yes. And then it, it sold like, off. It was like the hottest stock for about three months. It, it sold like, off. Can't get enough of satellite radio. It got down to a two handle in November of 2001. <laughs> and ever since then, it's been bouncing in this five to six range pretty much. So, yeah, kind of. it's been dead money for – it was six and a quarter in January of 2006. So, this yeah, thing, it is 618 right paid, now. Yeah, they paid Howard Stern like – a hundred million dollars. They paid him all, all the money. The profits they were ever going to make. Yes, they paid him all the money. Hopefully he hedged that because he's never seeing that action. You know, and, you, and, I, th- and I think they gave him stock too. Yeah, so it was I'm stock. Like, well, I think it was mostly stock, yeah. Uh, so anyway, either way, you know, you still, the stock still, it still comes out of the, you know, it's still going to come out of the earnings when you issue all those shares. Like, oh, great. We got, we have 500 billion shares of stock issued. <laughs> so all the shareholders get nothing. Um, so, uh, I think, um, it's, again, this is, this is a weird one. They buy the puts and then it finally falls when they, which wouldn't surprise me in this stock, to be honest. Like, I don't know. I think this is just a stock where nothing good happens. There you go. I'm just going to say it. I hate to say it, but if you want a stock that this might be one of those ones for people that like to write premium, you know, you just keep writing calls and you make your whatever and that's fine. But I mean, dang, the, the the thing that the stock never does anything. It's a great it's a great put right. Just sell the out the money puts every month. That's what made this trade so weird. This guy was scrambling to buy puts and in the weeklies, yeah. no less, not even in like a monthly or going out a few months. He had to have it now, which, again, it's Siri. It hasn't done anything for over a decade. So, yeah, to have to have those puts. And then it almost worked out for him until it did. <laughs> it's just uh, another thing too. kind of heartbreaking. Like, what's, and then Spotify and Siri, are they, they're worth about the same, you know? Mm. And Siri has been around for, what, 20 years now at least? And uh, and Spotify, like, you know, um, and to be honest, I think Siri is actually, you know, they actually, they have a, a general, like, like you know, a, a little bit of a profit stream or something going on at this point. Um, <clears throat> but... I think it's an interesting comparison, you know, because everybody's got all hot and heavy about Spotify, you know, Joe Rogan, all that kind of stuff. And that trades, it's still at a pretty rich multiple, I think. Um, you know, they have the same thing where they just pay these people so much money. Like, how are they going to ever make any money? But I'm sure they got to figure it out. So, yeah. We shall see. I guess sticking uh, radios in new cars when you buy them isn't exactly the uh, the bang up model that it used to be. Everyone's got on the old hot podcast trend. If only we were maybe early on that trend, let's say 15 plus years ago, maybe a, the good things. Oh, wait, we were good for us. <laughs> let's keep going here into let's see. Got another one to pay off here. Let's go to January 20th of this year. We were talking about Amgen, ticker symbol AMGN. I won't tell you where they're trading right now. Again, a little bit of a spoiler here. But at the time on the show, we profiled a weird ratio put spread. Don't see a lot of these going up. And this was opening on pretty much both legs. This was an, it wasn't a roll. Usually you see the one by two roll. It's kind of rolling down. It's a bit of a house money roll. This did not have that ilk. It was opening. So they bought the 220 puts in Amgen. They sold the 200 puts in February. They did it 3,675 by 7,350 times. So pretty much one by two. They did it for a buck eighty nine. It was about a thirty one ball, all things considered. Out there, the stock at the time was two thirty one. So they were looking for a little bit of downside action, but perhaps not too much. Listeners, remember they were buying one, selling two, or they were looking to pick up the stock shy of the two hundred handle. 
And it looks like, oh, by the way, this set was, was an earnings trade. There were earnings on the seven. So they're doing a one by two into earnings, which is interesting, perhaps a little bit dicey out there. But they needn't have worried, listeners, because the stock, well, let's look at the stock over the last month really quickly and see. Uh, earnings were the seventh. And yeah, the stock actually popped on earnings. The stock went from 223 on the seventh to 241 on the eighth before kind of gently drifting back down and expiring at, at 220 and three quarters. So pretty much right at the uh, 220 strike that they bought. So this put spread did a whopping knot for them, listeners. And they ended up wasting about 700 grand on this. If there is maybe any silver lining to this, you could say, well, it's a good thing, I guess, that they sold two of the 200 puts because that saved them around $350,000. Otherwise, they would have lost over a million bucks on this trade. But because they sold two, they ended up, instead of just buying those puts outright, they ended up at least saving themselves a little bit of moolah. Mr. Rock Lobster, a rear one by two put spread that was opening on both legs going into earnings. Don't see that too often. And maybe this is why it did not work out. <laughs> yeah, you're like, ah, well, you know, um, let's see, one by two. And I'm, I'm trying to, I was discerning this one, the how they did which. Uh, oh, so they sold two of the 200s and bought the 220s. Um, I'll tell you what, this is definitely a, what used to probably be one of the most dynamic sectors. And now it is no longer, uh, although Amgen is up a little bit today, but all these stocks in IVB, just the IVB ETF, uh, like great companies, but it's like biotech, biotech trades at like single digit multiples. <laughs> like that was not the way it was uh, when I started out. Biotechs were like the hot, they were the internet or whatever, social media stocks of the of the day. Um it looks like this was like a one-way trip to Palookaville, right? They paid about $1.85, and they're they're kind of in the no bueno land on this one, it, it, it feels like. Zippo. Yes, it was a one-way trip to Palookaville, as the Rock Lobster says so colorfully. And know what you folks always say colorfully. It's your questions and your comments. It is time for the Mail Block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block, the portion of the show where we break down your questions, your comments in a little bit more detail. We also ask you guys some questions right now. Our question of the week is we have Ukraine and the Fed both been kind of weighing on the markets of late. The Fed actually bolstering them a little bit since we posted this. How are you adjusting your trading in these trying times Give you four choices. Are you out there bargain hunting? Maybe a little bit of the old BTFD, scooping up some names that you think might be good out there, or you're pairing back your equity holdings, or are you buying crypto, or you're hedging your positions. And right now, 50%, exactly half of you, are doing some bargain hunting out there right now. A little bit of the old BTFD, followed by 25%, putting on the old puts. 16.7% saying you're reducing your equity holdings and about 8.3% saying, cover your ears, Uncle Mike. They're actually buying some crypto. So watch out out there. At Options is the place to go to make your voice heard. You got about a day or so left in our question of the week. We were talking earlier, Mr. Rock Lobster, about our historical place in the podcast world and how we were the first ever Options podcast. But it's good to know that we are still the best. In fact, looking here, just right before showtime, our, our editors are always looking at different stuff around the globe for different podcast things. And the site Feedspot, I'm not familiar with them, but they put out what they said, their best 15 option trading podcast. And Uncle Mike or The Rock Lobster, I will allow either of you to guess which show was the number one options trading podcast, according to these folks. The Option Block. How I, could I, you I, I possibly guess? guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was The Option Block, which according to these folks, by the way, this list was pretty much a list of my shows because I do so many. But uh, it, was, it was pretty much, what are the, your favorite Options Insider Network shows? There were a few other ones in there. You guys beat Options Action from CNBC, so well done. And you even beat up my Options Boot Camp show, which is a very popular show. You guys came in above that. So congratulations to you two there for being on the number one Options podcast in the world, gentlemen. What say you? Humbled and honored, as always. It's uh, it it is quite an honor. I'm happy for all the listeners that 
that can that can handle the dark and uh, the dark and stormy grumpy old man routine. Actually, I have students that now want to be part of the grumpy old man club because oh. apparently it's so much fun. <laughs> you need a new shirt. The grumpy old man club. Join the rock lobster here. <laughs> And then Uncle Mike could have his, you know, optimistic Uncle Mike shirt, and we could see which one sells better. A little bit of an A-B test out there. By the way, you guys should be thankful you're in the top 1% of podcasters around the planet. So congratulations to both of you out there. All right, let's keep on rolling here. Let's go to we all oh, we did. Uh, we did the Red Dawn on Monday. That certainly seemed to uh, trigger a lot of memory receptors for a lot of you 80s kids out there. A lot of people shared sentiments along those lines. Uh, you loved the movie. You thought the movie was crazy, I, which, again, the answer to both of those is yes. <laughs> it's not mutually exclusive. That movie is A, awesome, and B, completely bonkers, <laughs> which kind of makes it more awesome. I'll just read this one. This comes from YouTube, which I know a lot of you read, are listening to the shows, I should say, on YouTube these days. If you like YouTube, it's kind of an underheralded podcast platform. It's not our first distribution platform, obviously. But if you like listening to the shows on YouTube, have at it. They're out there for you. And Sean Keen came in from YouTube. He said, loved Red Dawn as a kid. Haven't seen it in 30 some odd years. Yikes. Time erosion. I'm starting to feel that gamma squeeze. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we all out there? But yeah, that was a, a fun one. I don't know. Mr. Rock Lobster, you're not really a, a huge 80s guy. Do you have any? You weren't on the show on Monday. Do you have any enduring memories of the epic 80s film that was Red Dawn, sir? Yeah, I actually have to laugh. I just remember the Cubans. Yes, the Cubans. The Cubans, Cubans, were the bad guy. Cubans paratrooping into Michigan, which I thought was Michigan at the time, turned out to be Colorado. Either way, it makes no sense that Cuban paratroopers are dropping yes. in there. But uh, who wants to oh, make sense how, when you're how doing many Red Dog? Can there be 50? <laughs> like, how, many, how many Cuban paratroopers can there be? Enough to conquer. Well, all the Cubans in charge of this little town. <laughs> Enough to conquer Michigan and or Colorado, apparently. <laughs> I, I think it was also an excuse to put in every handsome dude in Hollywood at the time, as I recall. This is like Patrick Swayze. It, it very much was. It was all yeah, the ladies like, and all the boys of the 80s. It was Patrick Swayze. Yeah. It was Charlie Sheen. It was C. Thomas Howell. It was Jennifer Grey and Leah Thompson, I want to say. And yeah. So basically they had the same yeah. cast in every movie. Yep. They just changed what the movie was about. Now they're fighting the Russians. Next movie so, they're making out in high school. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it was... Yes, I, I, I actually remember that. I, I thought that movie was mildly entertaining just because you go to the movies, I'm sorry, but I want to be entertained. And it was just beyond goofy, you know? <laughs> it was beyond goofy. Pretty dark, too. No spoilers, but it doesn't work out well for any of them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the 80s always had a dark twist. Mr. Uncle Mike, have you updated your viewing since then? Have you had a chance to catch the 80s genius that is Red Dawn since Monday, sir? I have not, but it's definitely on my list. Now, one of these days, I want to hear your, your own personal viewing report, your personal report of the 80s masterpiece that is Red Dawn. Now, so let's go to this one here quickly from Jason. Jason Cruz. He says, apologies if this has been covered on behind a couple of episodes. What happens to a short put if the ETF liquidates before expiration? Well, unfortunately, we all did see this. Not that long ago. It seems like a long time ago now because of all the madness has happened since 2020. But Valmageddon 2018, a ETP known as XIV, kind of infamously imploded. Mr. Rock Lobster, do you recall that? It seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it, Valmageddon? Oh, my God. Yeah, I think. Where did, where did XIV settle? Like a buck or something? Or something 50, insane like, like that, yeah. Yeah, it was a, what they'll do is they will have a settlement and a closing rotation. You just might not like the price. You know, it's. And the price, because I saw uh, several Chinese um, ADRs went through the same thing. They didn't, they, you know, the stock was trading and they didn't report. Basically, there was no company or whatever. So <laughs> they delisted the company. And, you know, literally when they had the opening, when they, when it reopened, they did a reopening rotation and everything settled at, you know, basically nothing. So it, it could be potentially zero. For the underlying price just keep that in mind so i mean i think people are asking that because of rsx um so i mean there there is potential like the thing is the securities are still real so i don't recall a time whereby just some regulatory agency just said hey um this doesn't exist anymore so legally i don't know how that's going to work out i think that's uncharted territory um 
as far as I can remember, and you know, I'm a little addled at this point, uh, maybe the OCC will put something out. I do know have several uh, of my students that can't trade certain securities now. They're European, and uh, banks that they trade with will not let them trade Russian securities. So it's again, it's a pretty big question mark. But historically, I like XIV, nothing. <laughs> I mean, that thing settled for nothing. That one kind of blew up. Mr. Uncle Mike, any stories to regale us with here in regards to uh, having a short put when an ETF goes the way of the dodo? I uh, haven't had that. So thankfully, it's it's not happened. But just have an understanding, everybody, that the risk is real. And sometimes if you pay a penny and buy a put, maybe at 50% of the value of the ETF itself, uh, in a situation like that, you might be glad you did. Are you telling our listeners to buy garbage again, sir? What's with you in the garbage? Hey, garbage can be a good thing sometimes. <laughs> it can be. And if folks want more, oh, before we even do that, let's do a combo around the block and where to find more content. Mr. Uncle Mike, we obviously got another crazy weekend full of risk ahead of us. What are you keeping an eye on until our show on Monday? And then B, if folks want to hit you up, check out some more of the Uncle Mike goodness. Where should they go? What should they do? <laughs> the Uncle Mike goodness. I What I'm watching for the weekend is definitely watching non-farm tomorrow. And uh, be careful this weekend because right now it feels like, ah, the market's past that pullback. And whenever you start feeling that, ah, moment, uh, it kind of gets me nervous a little bit. But anyway, uh, watching that. And then uh, if you're looking for a financial advisor who delves in the option product, uh, feel free to visit my website, stcharleswealth.com. Uh, if you're looking for content, I put out another YouTube video this week. Uh, check it out. Uh, you can just type in St. Charles Wealth Management, and it'll take you to my YouTube channel. I wrote another article this week on my for my website as well. Feel free to check that out. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter to get updates on all these things that I'm doing, at Mike Tosaw, T-O-S-A-W. Give the man a follow at Mike Tusa as the place to go on Twitter. St. Charles Wealth is also the place to go for all of his goodness online. And find him on the old YouTubes as well. He's got a video or two you may want to check out. And Mr. Rock Lobster, what are you keeping an eye on through this heady weekend here ahead of us? And then B, where should folks go if they want to get more Rock Lobster and or Volman in their lives? Um, you know, uh, oh, this weekend, you know, say like Mike said, I think if you want bargains, you know, look long term. Um, I've been kind of like I do this thing where every week I just add a little to a long term position uh, outside of any short term positions. I haven't added much to the short term position. I have to admit this week a couple of trades, but not very much um, just because vols high and things aren't moving and they're hardly decaying. So it's like, you know. Very odd, a very odd situation. Like I said, it, I think things can turn around for better or worse in a heartbeat at this point. So just for listeners to, you know, be aware of that. Um, sad but true. And uh, and uh, on a hot Friday note, go to OptionPit.com. Uh, our trade ideas have actually been doing quite well. So for uh, go to our membership page, or and uh, and uh, grab uh, any one of our products. So again, we're since we are aware of all of these. Uh, Let's just call them geopolitical shenanigans. That is how we lean our trading as well right now. So it is a it is a condition, and you just got to trade what you see. And it's a it's a mess till it ain't. A mess till it ain't. I could also describe the rock lobster's life, but instead, let's check out optionpit.com to learn more, all of his various newsletters and fun stuff. You can need more rock lobster in your life. He'll be back for all you seek a club of cool kids tomorrow 2 p.m central 3 p.m eastern to join me to break down the weird week worth of options activity over there in options audience but don't worry we're not done yet listeners hang out have a beverage if you're in the live chat listen to some fun stuff we'll put it in there for you we'll be back in exactly 26 minutes with uh, carly garner to join me there on twifo to break down to put it mildly the insane commodity markets out there right now a lot to unpack on Twifo. You can get started right now checking out cmegroup.com slash Twifo or check out their Twitter. They tweet out the Mover and Shakers report right before the show starts. And then, of course, back again tomorrow, Ball Views, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, options oddities after that, 2 p.m. central, 3 p.m. Eastern. Then back again on Monday after hopefully not another crazy weekend with another episode of the Option Block. Stay safe out there, everybody. 
You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options. StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.